maintaining still some of the flat files uh, system that should increase the speed. Um, before I actually start talking about that though, I have to admit that my primary motivation for giving a talk was to try to force myself into actually doing the work that I'm going to talk about in the talk. <laughs> and in that regard, I'm only slightly successful. So I managed to do some of it, but uh, I'm I've become too much of a, of a professional procrastinator to uh, be influenced by even giving a talk. So, but we'll, we'll see how this works out. Um, so uh, the first couple things that I'm going to talk about are just some general bug statistics. I, I enjoy showing uh, some plots. I'm going to introduce the basic architecture of dev bugs. Uh, uh, just to back up, dev bugs is the system behind bugs.deadend.org. Uh, so if you filed a bug, uh, you fixed the bug, um, you've wondered what bugs exist, you've interacted with that bugs. It has a, both a web front end and a mailing system. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the new features that have been implemented that you may not know if you haven't followed along, but I'm pretty sure most people here uh, follow along pretty closely, so it might be all old information for you. Um, I'm going to talk about some planned features. Uh, especially features that'll happen if I suddenly have two or three more people willing to help. And I um, hopefully will plea with all of you or people who are listening to this talk online or who may listen to this talk recording later to assist me in implementing some of these features. Uh, I'm a nice person. Uh, we have lots of nice people. Uh, and I'd like to see any Perl hackers or CSS hackers or JavaScript hackers or people who want to write documentation help me. So. Um, that's what I'm going to talk about. Okay, uh, the goal of the BTS is to report bugs, track the evolution of bugs, fix bugs, and hopefully reduce the impact of bugs, uh, both on maintainers and on users. Um, this is how many bugs we've got uh, versus time. So, uh, as you can see, our bug growth is roughly linear over time. Uh, it's actually decreasing slightly, but uh, we have a huge number of bugs. Uh, people like to track exactly how many bugs we have, and Christian Perrier does a, some uh, fun contest of guessing when particular bugs might be filed. Uh, for example, the uh, 760,000th bug uh, will be filed, uh, I, I think, uh, <laughs> September 2nd, uh, and the 800,000th bug will be filed almost a year from now in September 15th, assuming the linear progression maintains itself. Uh, so Christian will enjoy that, but he's not here, so maybe he'll see it online. Um, anyway, that's just showing the bug reporting rate. We average roughly 142 bugs filed a day. Um, and so you can see that's a huge number of bugs. The, this is the bug closing graph. Um, it's actually technically not bug closures. This is actually bugs being archived. Uh, but for the most part, this approximates the bug closure rate with a lag time of about two weeks. Um, so uh, we close roughly 95 bugs a day. Uh, so from that, you can imagine that the bug system is gaining 50 or so some odd bugs every day that are not being fixed. Um, Sort of unfortunately in this graph, you can see that the um, bug closure rate is decreasing. Um, and in context with the bug reporting rate also decreasing, this is something that I've seen um, in previous posts that I've made um, on my blog. Uh, this is actually kind of disturbing. I I'm not sure what that means for Debian as a whole, whether it means anything, but uh, it's, I I'd much rather see the overall rate increasing uh, than decreasing over time. Uh, and this graph uh, you're all familiar with. This is RC bugs, which are the bugs that are most important. Luckily, the RC bugs are uh, those that matter for the next release are decreasing. Um, and so we're, we're getting in line for a new release there, uh, doing OK. And of course, there's always too many RC bugs. OK, so that was enough on graphs. Um, now I'm going to talk about the actual debug system and how it works. Um, so debug two main components. There's a mail backend, which is what 
to interact with when you email control at bugs.debian.org or submit at bugs.debian.org or a bug number at bugs.debian.org. Um, and that system runs on a machine called Buxtahood, which has uh, all of the files and processes your email. It also, uh, the other aspect of Debugs is a web front end. Um, and that's what displays information on what uh, bugs are in which package and the bug logs that you can interact with. Um, and it's also mirrored onto another machine called Beach so that it's ideally slightly faster uh, to interact with. Um, Debugs interacts with DAC, which is the software which is responsible for maintaining the archive. So DAC tells Debugs which, who maintains which packages. Uh, so we know who, so Debugs knows who to send email to if there's a bug in a package. It also tells Debugs which packages are in which suites so, and which architectures. So Debugs can calculate whether a bug is present in a particular uh, suite. So for example, whether the bug affects unstable or whether it's fixed in uh, testing or stable, which is what was calculated in the previous graph I showed you. Um, Brittany also is the uh, testing migration uh, software that migrates software from unstable to testing. It uses information from the BTS as well in regards to whether a package is becoming more buggy or less buggy by upgrading it. So um, the actual thing that does that is sort of attached to Debugs. It's called bug status. And it provides a list of bugs. And it also does the RC bug graphs. Um, but it provides the list of bugs to Brittany. Um, Debugs itself looks like this. There's mail comes in. There's spam processing that happens on the first in. We try to throw out as much spam as possible. Uh, Blars Barson, who I believe will be here soon, I'm not sure if he's here yet, um, is primarily responsible for keeping uh, the bug tracking system relatively free of spam. And despamming the few, yeah, in expanding the few, or sorry, expunging the little bit of spam that actually makes its way into the BTS. Um, he does a largely thankless job. Uh, but people who, uh, so if you see Blars, thank him for doing that. Um, it's not a task that I would ever want to, to take on myself. And so um, he's done a really great job. Um, anyway, after the mail has been despammed, uh, then it goes through process all. Uh, and so process is responsible for handling email that gets sent to submit and email that gets sent to bug numbers. So like if you send an email to 12345 at bugs.dmn.org, that's where it goes. Um, service is responsible for handling all of control. So any email you send to control is handled as service. Um, now with the advent, advent of uh, control at submit or control at any other time you want to, these, this diagram has gotten a little bit blurred. There's actually an abstraction that service talks to that process can talk to as well, but that's the basic idea. Then all of the information is stored in flat files in a db-h directory, which has a small hash function to split out the bugs, um, and is indexed with a couple of flat file indexes. Uh, and then the CGI scripts use both the index indices and the flat file system uh, to display bugs to users. OK, so that's how um, dead bugs looked before I started working on the database. So the current plan is to add on and basically replace the indices with a database layer. Um, and so I'm going to keep parts of the flat file just because that's a well-tested system. There's lots of things that already parse the flat files um, that know how to deal with it. And add on top a PostgreSQL-based database that the CGI scripts will actually utilize in order to display information to, the, to users. Um, this will help both increase the speed at which you get results back if you're looking at complicated packages. And it'll also enable you to do more complicated things, like viewing bugs that actually aff affect a particular version um, without waiting for uh, huge amounts of time 
for a query to complete. So for example, if you wanted to look at all security bugs which affect unstable, well, that's actually a really hard query to do without a database layer doing that. And so that's one of the major things that the database is going to, to do. And so the script that actually handles loading things into the database is called deadbugs load SQL. Um, so deadbugs is written in Perl. So if you don't like Perl, uh, I'm sorry. But, uh, but Perl has recently come quite a ways in uh, its handling of databases. Most everybody has adopted the Perl idiom of using DBI uh, in order to talk to databases. It's a fairly successful database abstraction layer. Um, but anybody who's ever written code in DBI knows that it's extremely tedious to do joins and complicated statements um, where you're constantly writing SQL and dealing with escaping and et cetera, et cetera, or using placeholders. But still, it's something that you have to keep track of. So DBIX class is an extension that gloms together a huge number of Perl modules into a really coherent database abstraction service, where if you give it your schema, uh, it will build classes that enable you to talk to each of the result groups uh, from your database. Um, so it's a complete system. You can actually write a schema entirely in DBIX class that you can then convert into SQLite. You can convert it into PostgreSQL, MySQL, et cetera. Uh, in this case, though, I'm primarily interested in writing for PostgreSQL. That will actually be the primary database backend. Um, there might be an option eventually to use SQLite for testing, but my primary goal is to deploy to uh, PostgreSQL. I'm also using a bunch of classes that are specific to Debian. For example, the uh, Debian version extension to PostgreSQL that enables you to sort by Debian version, because that's extremely important for the BTS. Um, and that's something that's handled very well in PostgreSQL. So what I've actually done is I write the schema directly in SQL. And DBIX class has an extension called schema loader, which handles converting the SQL schema into the class declarations uh, for DBIX class automatically. So you just write plain old SQL like you're used to, and it automatically creates all of the database uh, related Perl classes that you use to talk to the results from the database. Um, there's another module which handles deployment. So it can do automated upgrades from uh, different schema revisions. So as you change your schema, uh, it handles doing both upgrades and new installs at a new schema, which you can also, it can also do uh, downgrades and you can do other things. Uh, in addition to just executing SQL alter statements, you can also run Perl code or anything else you wanted at the database at each upgrade step. Um, so that'll enable uh, much easier uh, changes to the schema in the future. Uh, finally, the actual module in Debugs that sort of abstracts this all out is Debugs DB. Um, and so all of the database interaction classes in Debugs are under that SQL module. Um, so this is the, uh, it's kind of complicated, but this basically tracks all of the bug relationships. It tracks who corresponded with the BTS, uh, it has all the source package versions, binary package versions, and version dependencies. So for example, when you upload a version that was based on a previous version, this uh, enables all that to be tracked. And it's, I've taken the DAC SQL schema as, um, as inspiration, but unfortunately, the debugs SQL diverges from DAC. And that's maybe something that if I was smart, I would less, but I think it makes sense currently. So, but anyway, if somebody is a PostgreSQL uh, genius or an SQL uh, hacker and is interested in maybe offering suggestions where I could make these more identical, I I'd definitely be interested to uh, talk to you about. OK, this is actually pretty easy. You just call debugs SQL bugs, and it'll load them. Uh, 
there are two different parts of bugs in debugs. There's the ones that you can actually modify, and then there are the archive bugs. So this handles uh, dealing both with, with both sets of bugs. You can also load versioning information. Uh, this loads which packages are dependent on other ones. And the dev info loads uh, the architecture um, and source versioning information. Um, so the SQL is actually working. This is an example of a, uh, a handwritten SQL query. But you could also write this using DBIX class. And let me show you that this actually works. Well, in theory here. Um, OK. Uh, yeah, maybe. Let's see. I always forget how to do this. Yeah. Well, I'll just type it here, and I'll show you the results. So it'll be easier. So I can run the select statement, which is just selecting the count of bugs where which have been modified since, uh, I think that's June or July, uh, which are not done and, uh, or sorry, which are, let's see, yeah, which are done and which there's an owner set. And the answer is 521 currently. So I mean, you could see that's a full load of all the bugs in Debian. And the actual SQL query, I mean, ex executes fairly quickly. Of course, I'm replicating the same query, so everything's been cached. But it'll give you an idea that it's still relatively quick. Oops. So I had hoped to have more of this done by the time of this talk, but there's still a lot of work that's needed. Um, the log files currently are not loaded. Uh, and so the log files are all the correspondence with the bug. Um, and so that's needed to enable full text searching of the BTS. Uh, it also currently doesn't do status caching. Um, and so that's what will enable faster loading of the package report page. Uh, and then it needs more work on the deployment to, or I actually need to deploy it to uh, the servers so you guys can use it. And it's not just sitting on my development setup. OK. So that's the major work with SQL, uh, which is the major thrust of this talk. I'd like to talk just a little bit about some of the new changes that have been done. Um, one of the more recent ones is um, using mail to links. So let's, let's pick a bug here. Let's do this one. OK, here's a nice bug. Um, so now there is a reply link, which includes the subject, the references header, uh, basically everything. So you can click it. It'll open up MUD or whatever your uh, MUA is that handles mail to links. It'll populate the references, the in reply to, and will give you most of the uh, message. Uh, the question is, why doesn't the subject also quote the bug number? Uh, it probably actually should. Uh, I think that's probably a bug. It just quote. <laughs> yeah, OK. So, yeah. Yeah, it probably should quote the bug number. Uh, but it, currently, all it does is it adds re to the original subject. And I was, it was really lazy when I, when I did that. But yeah, it, I should include the bug number in the subject. Uh, anyway, it, qu it quotes the original message, and it does that for um, all of the messages in the bug log. So uh, you can go down and. Is the two always the bug number? Is the two always the bug number? Yes. The two is currently always the bug number when you click on the reply link. So it doesn't go to the submitter? No. That's correct. It does not go to the submitter even if you're replying to the submitter. So that's something that, uh, that's another long-standing problem that actually needs to be really fixed, which I'll talk about uh, what needs to be done in order to fix that. OK. Oops. Um, so uh, other things, these are actually old, well, relatively old. Force merge now does the right thing. Uh, you probably, or you might have seen force merge failing occasionally, but 
it at least does all the operations that you would have had to do to merge them manually. So it calculates what has to be done, does it all for you. Um, the other major thing is control at submit time, uh, which, um, yeah, which you just you send any message, you use control colon as the pseudo header, and you write control commands as usual. Uh, and at submit time, the bug that you're submitting is negative one, uh, or the bug that you're mailing is negative one. So you could actually send control commands that influence a whole set of bugs. For example, if you sent the same email to 10 or 15 bugs and used control colon, I don't know, reassign negative one to some package, well, you would uh, however many bugs that you emailed. So you can actually use that as well to do multiplex control messages if for some crazy reason you wanted to. Um, okay, this, this is a set of the future features that I'm trying to work on. Uh, status caching, that'll come as a, a consequence of SQL work. Um, and so this will also enable you to do reverse status lookup where you can look up bugs by their status, which you can't currently do. You can only look up bugs in a general thing and then exclude on the basis of the status, which is really slow and not good. Um, one of the other major things that I, if I ever have enough time, is uh, better statistics. So, I mean, I've shown you the plots at the beginning. All those plots are sort of manually generated. I had to generate them before I gave the talk today. Uh, it would be much nicer if a huge set of statistics could be generated all the time, hourly, or even up to the minute, so that people can see what's going on with the bugs and who's fixing the most bugs and which packages uh, need more help because their maintainer is not responding or who's doing a really good job triaging bugs so we can identify them and thank them and promote them. Um, all those sort of things are things that better statistics uh, will help. Some other things. Um, I would like to implement a, a web-based reporting system, uh, not completely web-based, but at least with submission of bugs using HTTP to some CGI uh, with a report bug or something else as the actual interface to that. Uh, and that'll get rid of uh, people having to have a working MUA or, well, report bug doesn't currently require a working MUA, but it require, or MTA, but it does require that port 25 and 587 work so you can talk to uh, Bugs Master. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people's networks currently don't allow 25 and even more are starting to disallow uh, 587 outgoing. Um, so, but most people at least allow 80 outgoing. So that's something that will uh, need to be fixed. Um, the major reason why I haven't already implemented that uh, is because I want to make sure that people who are submitting the bugs actually uh, have a working email address. Now, you can mail bugs without a working email address, um, but at least that requires that you could send mail. Um, so I want to set that up so that uh, people get an email saying, hey, you emailed that bugs. Uh, click this link, and once you do that once, it won't ever ask you again. Um, but uh, that's something that I want to do. Uh, second thing is I actually want to release Debugs again. Debugs hasn't had a release outside of experimental, uh, and it in, I mean, since the entire time I've been working on it. So, uh, which is a, a very long period of time, and that's mainly my fault, but uh, yeah, so it'd be good to do that. Um, the Third thing that's on this list is bug mailing lists actually in debugs. And so this is what's actually going to solve the submitter uh, issue. So the basic idea is that the submitter will be install or will be subscribed to a per bug mailing list by default, um, where they can easily opt out of it. It'll do proper headers and bounce handling. Uh, and by doing this in debugs, it can also avoid the same person getting the du duplicate email. So if you are the submitter and also the maintainer, uh, this will keep you from getting multiple duplicates of the email. If you're also subscribed to the bug list or, and the packaging list, this will also help a little bit. 
the packaging email you'll still get, or from the PTS you might still get, but this will at least help reduce the number of duplicates. And it will also enable people to set up uh, defaults BTS-wide. So if they never want to see uh, submit emails to submitter or to bugs which they've submitted, then they can opt out once and they'll never see them again. Or they can decide later to opt in and they'll be able to see them. Um, okay. The other one is uh, merge bug reports currently have two separate log files, which you don't combine. So anybody who's ever dealt with a merged bug knows that the history of the bug is sometimes difficult to ascertain. You have to go view all the, the bugs. And if, if it's two bugs, that's annoying, but okay, you could do that. If it's 20 bugs that have been merged, which sometimes happens, it's now almost impossible to figure out which bug has all of the history in it, which one's the most important. Um, so that's something big that needs to be done. Another one is uh, threading in the email, in the uh, bug report view, so you can actually see who's in response to, who, to whom. Um, another major one is user categories currently cannot be easily duplicated or replayed. So if a package has a user category or user tags that you want to emulate, it's really difficult for somebody else to duplicate that um, unless you keep the email that you sent to the BTS somewhere and modify that. Uh, there's no way to take what's currently in the BTS and pull it back out and replay it. Um, so that's actually something that somebody who is interested in helping out could write that up just as easily as I could. Um, so if somebody's interested in working in Perl, that would be a really useful thing to merge. Um, another thing is remote attachments. Uh, there's an RFC that enables you to have email attachments which are not included in the email, which you can obtain remotely. Uh, it would be nice to not email out core dumps to people who probably don't want to receive a you know, 20 or 100 meg core dump in their email that they're going to download from the BTS anyway eventually, So um, if they ever want to look at it at all. Uh, so that sort of thing would be very useful. Um, and the CGI needs smarter options so that um, uh, the, the query strings aren't as long and they do more of the right thing all the time. Um, most, some of these have actually already been done. This is a little old, but, but there's a lot of places that need help. So uh, if you're interested in helping, and hopefully you, or at least some of you are interested in helping, please get in contact with me. Um, this is how you can actually get started. Uh, all of the code running on Debian.org is on bugs.debian.org. Debian branch is the branch that is actually running. Okay. Yeah, I'll just... So the Debian branch is the branch that's actually running on bugs.debian.org, uh, and you can check that branch out. Uh, and the branches are also checked out as well if you just want to browse exactly what's running. Um, if you want to follow what I'm doing, uh, my branch is at get.armstrong.com slash deadbugs, uh, and I generally try to keep them in sync with what's on bugs.debian.org, but sometimes I'm running behind. Um, the mailing list is Debian Debugs at list.debian.org. Feel free to email that. You can also email me. I'm don at debian.org. Um, there's also an IRC channel, Pound Debugs, on irc.debian.org. And I'm Don Del Carlo there. So I'm friendly. I'd love to talk to anybody. If you have questions too, BTS isn't working the way you expected it to, versioning isn't going the way it should, feel free to contact me on IRC or email me. And you can also get in contact with owner at owners, owner at bugs.debian.org as well. Owner's the group that runs Debugs. Um, this is the team. Uh, and hopefully you will join us. So with that, any questions? Uh, I apologize. I'm going to be disappearing relatively soon after this talk. So if you have questions, find me quickly or find me online. I'll be at Burning Man the rest of the week. So. Okay, any questions? Or comments or complaints or do you 
have a performance goal on the uh, on the update once you have Postgres uh, Postgres running? Uh, I mean, what do you mean, like a? Uh, when you do a query on, a, on an individual um, uh, bug right now, it's usually about five seconds. Yeah. And that's kind of okay for some things, but if you're using, if you're doing discovery, it can be really, really onerous. I mean, it, it should be less than a second. It's, okay. It's, I mean, especially for, uh, like, for individual bug logs. Uh, so for viewing an individual bug log, um, that's a slightly different problem than the database. Uh, there's an issue with there because it has to read the entire bug log in order to display it. Um, uh, and I, I'm working on splitting out the individual message, messages so the entire bug log doesn't have to be read in order to start displaying it. Um, yeah, and, and, and fortunately part of the reason why I haven't done that yet is because I don't want to reinvent the wheel. What needs to happen is some sort of... Uh, um, milder like thing with some customization um, that also allows for detached attachments so that you can separate out a very, very large attachment that you're never going to actually display into a separate file. And I, I'm assuming somebody's invented this, which is why I haven't actually sat down and done it myself. Um, so I've sort of been lazy trying to figure out exactly how that's going to work. But yeah. So, uh, just quickly, so I've done a lot of work with the historical bug data which you had in there. Is the database going to erase this distinction between archived bugs and non-archived bugs? Um, so, it probably won't erase the distinction, at least as far as emailing goes. Um, so, the major reason, okay, so the historical reason for archiving bugs was they were deleted at one point in time. Um, and so then saving them was a brilliant idea. Uh, and so they're now, they haven't been deleted in a long time. Um, the other major reason why we archive bugs and why that's actually useful is because it means that they can no longer be mailed. Uh, and really old fixed bugs primarily collect spam. That, that's all that goes to them. Um, so it's quite possible that the, uh, I, I haven't, I mean, I'm leaning in this direction that I will disable email to really old bugs. But besides that, they will still be, I mean, you can still do control changes to them and things like that. Exactly, yeah, th there'll be basically no distinction between them. Uh, I mean, yeah, at least that's the idea. Sorry. So uh, back to the bug at an bug submitter at. Um, this is something that has caused problems, like people mailing the bug and the submitter not getting, like asking the submitter, could you maybe try something different? And the submitter doesn't get the email. Uh, I think the mailing list thing is like a great idea, but it's probably a lot of work. Could it be possible to have a new address like dash all or something and get the link in the web page use this new address so that everyone gets the email so yeah the um i mean it would be possible uh to change it so that like emailing the bug number dat, uh, dash submitter would also email the submitter as well as the bug number currently all it does is email the submitter um so i, I this is a change that's been talked about, and I, I should have just done this already, but but I always forget about it. So, uh, so yeah, so I'm going to change dash submitter to um, actually email the bug and the submitter, no matter what, even if they opt out in the mailing list eventually, once that happens. Um, uh, is this not separate from dash quiet? Okay, so when you email, so yeah, I, so the question or the issue is that emailing submitter sets the reply to to dash quiet. Yeah, I'll, I'll fix that. That's that's dumb. The, the unfortunate thing is there's a lot of things that made sense historically that 
have changed and some of the things that Deadbox does, I don't even know that it does because I don't always pay attention to what it's doing. Um, so, okay, so I'll fix that. Uh, I'll try to get everybody. One thing that I noticed that's a little bit different about how debug works and a lot of other bug tracking systems work is that there doesn't seem to be a way to close a bug as done but not actually done. Uh, like, won't fix, yeah, like, you could do close, but the policy seems to indicate you shouldn't do so. Is there a historical reason for that? So you can just tag it won't fix and, and close it if you're not going to ever fix it. I mean, the, the major reason to not um, close it is historical, and it's also because it's easier to discover common bugs that you're not going to fix if they're not closed. Um, but yeah, that, that's largely a historical thing. Uh, I mean, the, there isn't really a way to say that it's not a bug at all, like the user is, is mistaken, um, but you can... I mean, just close it in that case with a note. So. Uh, aside from critical mass of, you know, 800,000 bugs, what does Debugs offer as far as distinction from other bug tracking systems, and why do we invest in our own solution? I mean, what, what is it about Debugs that is unique for uh, our distribution's bug tracking needs? So this is a really good question. There's two aspects to it. The major one is that it's totally interactable via email, which is a major thing. The absolutely critical aspect, though, for Debian and why we couldn't use any other BTS system without a lot of work is that Debugs does versioning. So it knows exactly, assuming that you set up the found and fixed versions correctly, it knows in the version tree which nodes have been fixed and which are not fixed. And so that enables you to um, figure out whether a package is buggy in testing, whether it's buggy and stable, et cetera. All that would have to be added on to any other bug tracking system that we, we used. If we were to switch it. I'd just like to say thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Did I miss anybody who had a question? Wave at me and feel free to ask me as well at, at well over email or whatever. Or you can even call me if you want. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>